Um, for those of you who have uh, seen our story before, this will be a nice update on some of the uh, exciting events that have taken place. And those who haven't seen it, this is our first time presenting at the Mesa, uh, give you an overview of what we're doing at Miro Matrix and some of the transformative technologies that we're developing. Um, with that, our overall mission is to eliminate the organ transplant waiting list by bioengineering transplantable organs. I think we all know that there's a tremendous need uh, for transplantable organs and the shortage that exists, but you know, it's, it's always surprising when you see the facts that 22 people die each day waiting for an organ. Our solution to that problem is to bioengineer the organ by using our patented perfusion decellerization technology. This is our ability to actually take whole organs, cannulate them, perfuse a mild detergent through them, and remove all the cellular material. That provides us the ultimate scaffold or the ideal scaffold then to be able to recellerize that, where we then place that into a bioreactor, add cells back in there, and now be able to create that transplantable solution. So I'll walk through this and kind of give you a sense on where we are in the spectrum of this uh, throughout the introduction and talk today. Uh, quick overview of Miro Matrix. We were founded in 2009. We licensed technology out of the University of Minnesota based on perfusion decellerization and recellerization. Uh, those patents have now issued worldwide. Um, our, our program focus, our lead program is a liver. Uh, over 40,000 patients die each year of end-stage liver failure. But there's no, al there's no alternatives. There's no dialysis, there's no drugs, um, and there's no uh, devices to be able to treat these patients. Unfortunately, the only therapy is a transplantable kit, uh, liver. Our second program is a transplantable or bioengineered kidney with an estimated over about a half a million patients on dialysis today. The need is really large to be able to create new solutions in that space. And then we're also partnered with uh, Texas Heart on bioengineering a transplantable heart. But along the way and early on in our development, and I'll get into this a little bit into our talk, it was also important as an early stage biotechnology company to actually commercialize products. And I'll get into both the regulatory side of this and the commercial side of this, but we've successfully developed, uh, manufactured, uh, and received regulatory uh, clearance for Miro Mesh, which is soft tissue reinforcement in a Miro Derm product, which is for advanced wound care. And we've just completed two multi-center prospective clinical studies on those products as well. So if we look at a whole organ and we think about this a little bit more in the sense of how would you engineer an organ, you, you primarily need three components. You need cells, extracellular matrix, and you need vasculature. You put those together and you need combinations and you can derive any organ inside of the body. Now, tissue engineering obviously has been around for a long time, late 90s, early 2000s. That notion was to be able to create new tissue. And that's to be able to take cells out of a patient, grow those onto a scaffold, whether that's a synthetic scaffold or a biologic scaffold, and then transplant that back into a patient. And over to the right, that's actually cardiac muscle. So in theory, this works, right? You can take cells, you can isolate them, you can put them on a scaffold, you can grow tissue. The challenge there is, while that's cardiac tissue, it's also translucent. You can see through it. So if we start thinking about the therapeutic potential of it, clearly it's limited because it's missing that third component and primarily it's missing the vasculature. And this is just a cartoon drawing of what the liver looks like and you can see the kidney over to the right, but you can see that extensive vasculature that exists inside of our organs, inside of our tissues. And this is really what our technology solves, is that ability to take uh, an organ that nature already created in this sense, this is a, a porcine heart and a porcine liver, again, cannulate that, perfuse a mild detergent through it and rapidly remove all the cellular material. So on the top there, you can see by 48 hours, we have a completely decellerized heart. The liver is even more rapid uh, and that's by 24 hours, it's completely decellerized. And these are large complex tissues that we're able to effectively and rapidly decellerize. Just to highlight the fact that all that vasculature is still maintained in here, here's a completely decellerized porcine liver. We now cannulate this. This doesn't have any cells in it right now. It's completely acellular and now perfuse blood through this real time. And what you be able to see here um, is the actual perfusion. So you can see all those vascular conduits, all those vascular channels down to the capillary bed still exist inside the matrix. It's not leaking out of the capsule. You can see a little bit of bleeding there where the gallbladder was because we excised that off. However, if we cut the liver at that point, it would bleed like it natively would bleed. So now we've kind of got that perfect scaffold in a sense to set up that ability that what we've solved is the extracellular matrix and the vasculature. Now to be able to bring this all back together, now you would seed cells onto it to be able to create that solution 
lower left-hand corner down there kind of describes what we're looking at and the notion would be start with the pig organ, um, unlimited supply, good supply chain associated with that, decelerize that, place that into a bioreactor and then seed human cells onto it. As I mentioned, this technology was first invented in the University of Minnesota. It's where they took a rat heart, decelerized it, recelerized it, and it started to beat again. It really took tissue engineering from that thin substrate to something that now is clinically relevant. Since then, other academic institutions have used our technology. Uh, nice proof of principle, decelerizing lungs and kidneys, recelerizing them and showing that there's functionality associated with them. From our standpoint, what we're focused on is how do we bring this technology all the way to the clinic? Uh, and to do that, we've divided this up into four different key areas. First, demonstrate that perfusion decelerization is effective, that we're able to um, effectively commercialize and be able to manufacture it. And more importantly, if we start with a pig substrate, can we demonstrate that that's non-immunogenic? What we decided to do for that was actually go the route of commercializing technology and creating products. So this is where Miro Mesh, that's for soft tissue reinforcement, and Miro Derm, were launched. And more specifically, if we look at that, we built our own commercial uh, manufacturing facility. You can see it there. We can simultaneously decelerize up to 50 organs at a time. But by utilizing the 510K process, we were then able to bring these two products to the market. So we saw a market need that our tissue could solve. At the same time, it also opened up that opportunity to say, if we're going to build an organ and we want to start with a, with a porcine source, how do we know that that's not immunogenic? Well, by commercializing these products, we've now had our decelerized liver matrix implanted into thousands of patients without any adverse events associated with anything uh, on the immune side uh, reported back to us. We just completed up a prospective two-year prospective uh, clinical study on um, Miro mesh for hiatal hernia repair. Uh, we are also getting ready to publish a retrospective analysis of 85 consecutive patients that were treated with that, a mean follow-up time of 1.3 years. Um, and that what we're happy to report is we still have no reintervention reported in both of those clinical studies. So the product's performing very well. It continues to do well. And we're excited to get this um, clinical data published and get more uptake of Miro mesh inside the marketplace. The other product that we launched, as I mentioned, is Miroderm. So that, again, is completely decelerizing a porcine liver and now creating a wound care product for this. And we just completed on this one as well. We just wrapped up um, last month a 55-patient prospective nine-center study on this where we specifically looked at Miroderm um, to be able to treat DFUs that had previously failed to advance biologic treatment. So patients had to have a, a DFU, long-standing, um, failed two previous biologic treatments. And then if you, down on the left-hand side, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but if you look at that, that kind of gives you a interim analysis. This is analysis of the first 20 patients inside of this clinical study. But the surprising thing was the wound age at time of treatment was 392 days. Um, you can see that these were very long, challenging DFUs. Over the first 20 patients that finished for protocol, we were able to close over 55% of those patients. More importantly, if you look at the, the number of patients, the remaining nine patients that didn't close within those 12 weeks, and that's over the right-hand side, four of those patients had over an 80% decrease in wound size. So, uh, you know, if, if the study was longer, potentially, we could see a wound healer rate as high as 75%. So we're excited about this as well in terms of what it's doing as a product in the marketplace. So that really set us up from the standpoint of demonstrating that perfusion uh, decelerization is effective, that we can commercialize this, we can create products, and more importantly, they're well tolerated in, inside of patients. And now we start to focus on the recelerization side. So what's our ability to actually now take these scaffolds, add cells back into them to now be able to create that highly functionalized tissue? Over the right-hand side, that's just a couple of livers that are in a bioreactor that are being continuously perfused with media. So for this, we kind of set out five different design criteria. First, it needed to be easy to implant. Well, the nice thing about our technology is from the standpoint that you're decelerizing the liver. So transplant surgeons, you're not giving them something new. The matrix needs to be non-immunogenic. I just demonstrate how we de-risk that with our current commercial products that we have on the market. The next important thing is it needs to contain a functional vasculature. So earlier, I showed you that liver being perfused with blood, um, but there were no cells in that. That would, that would thrombose very, very rapid. Um, so what's our ability to now re-endothelialize that or add vascular cells back into there? 
because without that, it doesn't matter what other cells you put in there. If you don't have active perfusion to a bioengineered organ, it's essentially going to become necrotic. And then your ability to add functional hepatocytes and then functional bile ducts into that. So for that first step, we spent a lot of time on the, on the functional vasculature. And this is what it looks like here. So we're able to take a bioreactor, seed in uh, human endothelial cells. We look at distribution at 21 days. We see good distribution histologically. Right-hand side is a scanning electron microscopy. And you can see good distribution of the cells on the lumen of a vessel as well. We see about 5 to 10 percent overall endothelial cells on there and continue to culture them under perfusion as they continue to multiply and proliferate. But the open question is, is it functional at that point? So what we did next is actually transplant these back into a pig. So on the left-hand side there is a re-endothelialized liver getting ready to be anastomosed in, and that's what it looks like after we take off the clamps, which looks very similar to a native liver at that point. So I've got a nice video of this. So we've got clamps on the inflow and outflow, and now we're just going to go in, and I'll show you what this looks like once we remove the actual clamp. So there we're taking off the clamp on the portal vein. Now you're going to see that graft start to prime up. You're going to see perfusion throughout the graft at this point. Uh, upper right-hand side of, of that central liver lobe there, you're going to see it's still white because we don't have the circuit complete. Now we take off that outflow clamp. Now it's complete. So at this point, we've now bioengineered a liver construct, revascularized it, transplanted it back inside a pig, and now we've got that native blood flowing through it. And now the open question is, well, how long does it continue to perfuse underneath that model? So to be able to look at that, we then went forward with the model of uh, creating the surgical model without any anticoagulants, so no heparin, no antiplatelets. And we transplant these back into a porcine model, and then we do CT scan with contrast at day one, day three, day seven, and day 10, and look at how well the graft's actually being perfused. Our initial data on this, this here is what it looks like postoperatively. You can see the, the liver is outlined in, in yellow, and then where it's being able to be perfused, that's contrast that's going into it. So postoperatively, good perfusion of our graft. One day looks great. Three day, we're starting to see shadowing in a couple areas, but you can see out to seven days, now we're down to about 10 to 15%. So still a great achievement in terms of how far we made it, but to create a long-term solution, we need to go beyond seven days. So the open question was, since we're putting human cells into this, are we seeing an immune response? So that's what we went in and looked at next, is can we extend this with immunotherapies? So a lot of stuff on this slide, but basically what we did in this is we had a no treatment group, and then we did immunosuppression with high dose steroids and repeated all the CT scans. With no treatment, we consistently get perfusion that out to about day three and by day seven, it's completely thrombosed. By simply putting them on a 10-day immunosuppression protocol, now we're able to extend that perfusion out to easily to seven days and beyond. Uh, some of the graphs go 10 to 15 days. Um, we characterize the overall flow through the graft on the bottom. And um, on the bottom right-hand side is actually cytotoxicity data where we actually look at the immune response. So what we're able to see is we're able to suppress that immune response out to day three, and then once that immune response comes back up, that's when we see thrombosis of the graft again. So we're putting human cells back into a pig, but really being able to demonstrate that that lack of flow that occurs later on is really tied to the immune response associated with it. So we're able to do next, now that we've created the model and we really have that seven to 10 day window, now we can start focusing on how do we go after a rescue associated with that. So now we're seeding in hepatocytes. We're able then to look at the functionality by dosing in high doses of ammonia and then looking at the clearance of the ammonia associated with that and the secretion of urea that occurs. So what we're being able to do next, we're at the phase of actually bringing that all back together. So here's a graph that's been being perfused in a blood loop for 30, um, 30 minutes, this has hepatocytes and it has endothelial cells into it. And now we're gonna do an angiogram. And you get a good sense here of the vascular patency going down through the capillary beds that dies going back out and then exiting the liver. So really good demonstration overall of, of the functionality of the liver. So what does this set us up for now? So we've demonstrated the perfusion decellerization, recellerization, and we're really focused on the pig rescue. That's to bioengineer the liver, place it into an animal, take out their native liver, and then demonstrate functionality. We're looking to complete that in the next six months and then report on that. That then really sets us up overall in terms of our scheme to continue to then use that data to then um, go forward with data, um, GLP studies to support an IND, IND submission. And our focus on this is then to get it into the clinic. 
I didn't talk about a lot about kidney because of the time of this. Similar timeline, we've got a very active program on kidney and making good progress with that. So with that, I'll end. Any questions, happy to take them offline, but thanks, thanks for your time. Thank you.